me the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Who you 
praise you this morning for the God um, that you are, the God of strength, the God of mercy, the God of comfort, the God of healing. God, thank you for being our protector. Thank you for being our defender. And God, just help us to open our hearts completely to you and to the word that you've given to Steve this morning that will go from here changed and be the light, your light to the dark world around us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't usually tell blonde jokes because I don't think blondes are any less intelligent than anybody else. And by the way, when I was a child, I had blonde hair. But this morning, I'm going to make an exception. I'm going to tell a blonde joke. It's all in good fun. So I'm going to tell this, trusting that those of you who are blonde will not take offense. But I heard about one blonde lady who, she got tired of all the blonde jokes. So she decided to go to the beauty parlor and get her hair cut and dyed. And after that, she got in her car and she decided to take a ride out in the country where she came upon a, a shepherd with a bunch of sheep. So she pulled over and she decided to have a conversation with this shepherd. And there was some chit-chat for a while. And then she made a proposition to the shepherd. She said, if I can guess how many sheep are in your flock, can I have one of them? We didn't think there was any way she would know how many sheep he had. So he said, sure. If you can guess how many sheep I have, you can have one. So she guessed, 382. And to his amazement, she was exactly right. So being true to his word, he allowed her to pick out whatever sheep she wanted and she could have it. So after she picked out her sheep and put it in her car, the shepherd said, now I've got a proposition for you. He said, if I can tell you your original hair color, can I have my dog back? <laughs> now again, I share that. Not to offend anyone, but because that story has something in common with the story we're going to look at from Scripture this morning. In both stories, there was a true shepherd, and there was a only wannabe shepherd, or shepherds. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, back in Jesus' day, liked to consider themselves the shepherds of God's people, Israel. But in John 10, where we're going to be this morning, Jesus describes them as discredited shepherds. He reveals that he is the good shepherd. So this morning, as we continue to look at the different I am statements Jesus made right before describing himself with some kind of an image, we're going to take a look at this image of the good shepherd this morning. 
Two weeks ago, we saw that in John 6, Jesus used the image of bread to describe himself. He said, I am the bread of life. And he said, I am greater than Moses, your father, who gave you the manna to eat in the wilderness. Because whoever eats my bread will never go hungry. Then last week we saw in John 8 where Jesus used the image of light. He said, I am the light of the world who guides you like that pillar of fire guided the Israelites through the wilderness. And he went on to say, before Abraham was, I am. So in essence he's saying, I am greater than your father Abraham. Because before Abraham was born, I am God. And now this morning, here in John 10, Jesus uses the image of a shepherd. So we're going to let this rock wall be our sheep pen this morning. And that will be our image. And I'll explain more about that here in a bit. But when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he seems to be alluding to David. The greatest king in Israel's history who at one time was a shepherd. And Jesus seems to be saying, I am even greater than David, the great shepherd king. So the theme throughout all these different I am statements of Jesus is that Jesus is greater than anyone or anything because he is God, the great I am. But to really make sense out of our text this morning, I think it helps to know that there were two common types of, of sheep pens back in that day and age. Here in the first five verses of John 10, Jesus is referring to a large communal sheep pen where many shepherds would come and they would put their sheep all in one big pen and it would have a, a watchman guarding the, the entrance so that the only people that could get in were the shepherds who had sheep inside. So he was there kind of checking IDs to make sure that only those who came in were shepherds of those sheep. So when Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, one thing this image teaches us is he knows me. He knows me. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 where Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. You see, the teachers of the law claimed to be the shepherds of the Jews. But Jesus is saying, they are nothing but imposters. He's the real shepherd. And a vivid example of this truth can be seen if we peek back a chapter earlier. If you look back at John 9, we see where Jesus and his disciples encounter a blind man. And Jesus is asked, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's blind? And they ask this because the teaching of the day was that bad things happen to evil people. But Jesus said, this man isn't blind because of anyone's sin. Then he makes some mud, he puts it on the man's eyes, and he tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And when the man does this, his sight is restored. But instead of being happy for him that, that he can see again, the religious leaders were only interrogating him. They weren't happy at all. They ultimately threw him out of the synagogue. They didn't shepherd this man at all. They shunned him. They treated him as though he was a bad sheep. When in reality, they were just bad shepherds. They didn't even know the man. They just assumed that he ha must have sinned and therefore he deserved to be blind. So instead of trying to assist him, they just made assumptions about him. Jesus, on the other hand, says these religious leaders are like thieves and robbers sneaking in to the sheep pen. They were not the true shepherds of the people. They were imposters. Friends, there are a lot of imposters in our world today, who are constantly trying to steal us away from the good shepherd. The thief of performance sneaks in and says, follow my rules. The thief of pleasure comes along and says, follow your feelings. The thief of, thief of pluralism calls out to us and it says, it doesn't matter who you follow. 
I think one reason our world is so messed up today is because too many people are following these other voices instead of following the one true voice of the good shepherd who knows us inside and out. In the analogy Jesus uses, the good shepherd of the sheep was allowed in by the watchman. And verse 3 says, he knew the sheep so well, he could call them by name. I read where shepherds back in that day and age used to name their sheep according to their characteristics. So one sheep might be called long nose, another one black ear, another one patch, or whatever. But a true shepherd knows his sheep. And in verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Unlike the imposters, Jesus knows each of us personally and intimately. Remember the story of Zacchaeus we looked at a few weeks ago? About the wee little man who climbed up a tree to see Jesus? When Jesus came by and saw him up there, Jesus didn't say, Hey, who's that guy up there in that tree? He already knew. He called Zacchaeus by name. Like a good shepherd. And Jesus knew the blind man when he came upon him as well. The teachers of the law didn't know this guy, but Jesus did. He knew this man wasn't blind because of anyone's sin. In fact, Jesus, as the good shepherd, knew everything about this man. All the way down to the most intimate detail. And the good shepherd knows you and me as well. He says, I know my sheep. And my sheep know me. Just as, just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father. Wow. Jesus knows you as well as he knows his Father. And the Greek word for know in this verse, it's the word gnosko. Which means to know experientially. It, it, the Jewish idiom there was in reference to physical intimacy. So Jesus isn't talking here about just common knowledge when he says, I know you. He's not talking about book knowledge. He is talking about knowing each and every one of us up close and personal in a very intimate way. He says, I know your past and your pain and your potential. He says, I know your disappointment and your doubts and your dreams. I know you inside and out. And I love you from head to toe. If you're a parent, think about what runs through your mind when you go into your child's room at night and watch them sleeping. They may have been in trouble all day long. Making messes, getting into things, trying to flush the cat down the toilet, whatever. And you probably had to fight and threaten and finagle just to get them to finally settle down and go to sleep. But now that they're laying there so peacefully asleep in bed, what happens? You're suddenly reminded of how full of love your heart is for that child. More love than that child could possibly imagine. You know their faults. But you see their potential. And you're eager to help them fulfill that potential and become something special. Am I right? Now with that thought in mind, when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, I want you to imagine the good shepherd looking down on you that way. Maybe stroking your cheek. But looking at you with that same kind of love. He knows your faults. But he loves you with more love than you could possibly imagine. Then the second truth we can learn about Jesus from this image of the good shepherd is he leads me. He leads me. Let's look at verses 3 through 5. Where Jesus says, The watchman opens up the gate for him, the shepherd, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Now we've already seen that the good shepherd knows his sheep. 
But before he can lead them, before they can follow him, they have to know him. You see, this is a reciprocal relationship that's being described here. Verse 14 says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. When a shepherd was allowed entrance into the sheep pen by the watchman, he could call his sheep by name and they would know their shepherd's voice, so then they would come to him. But if someone else called them, they wouldn't come because that was a voice they didn't recognize. So let me ask you this morning. Do you know the shepherd? Do you know how to identify his voice over all the other voices that are calling out to you to follow them? He already knows you. But you might still need to get to know him a little bit better. And you do that the same way you get to know anybody else. By talking to him. Through prayer. By listening to him. Through scripture. By inviting him to be with you. As you ask the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in your heart. And it is important to know him. Because only then can I follow him. I can't follow him if I don't know him. So it's important that I know him. He is the good shepherd that leads me in the very best direction for my life. That's the shepherd I want to follow. But to do that, I have to know him. When Jesus encountered the blind man, he made mud out of saliva, he put it on the man's eyes, told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Jesus was leading him. He, he was giving him direction as to what he needed to do next. And if that blind man wouldn't have listened to Jesus, if he wouldn't have followed what Jesus told him to do and gone to that pool and washed, he probably would have remained blind. He would have remained in darkness. But he listened to Jesus. He took direction. He followed where Jesus led him to. And he was healed. The good shepherd wants to lead us from darkness into light as well. The world's calling for us to follow the, the wide path of the counterfeit kingdom. It's full of death, deceit, destruction. But Jesus calls us to follow him down that narrow path in the kingdom of God that leads to light and truth and eternal life. So who are you following this morning? Whose voice are you listening to? The voice that says get even? Or the voice that says forgive as God has forgiven you? The voice that says let somebody else tell others about Jesus. Or the voice that says, let your light shine before men. The voice that says, fit in with the crowd. Or the voice that says, stand up for Jesus. The voice that says, ignore the poor. Or the voice that says, give to those in need. The voice that says, criticize others. Or the voice that says, encourage one another and build each other up. The voice that says, climb the, the ladder of worldly success as high up as you can go. Or the voice that says, walk that humble road of service and sacrifice. Only one voice will lead us in the right direction. Only one voice will lead us to lasting peace and contentment and joy. Only one voice can give our life meaning and purpose. It's the voice of the bread of life who satisfies the deepest longings of our soul. It's the voice of the light of the world, who casts out the darkness of guilt in our heart. It's the voice of the good shepherd, who knows us personally and intimately, and who leads us through the battles of life, to ultimate victory, where we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that leads right into the third truth about Jesus. We can learn from this image of the shepherd. And that is, he cares for me. He cares for me. The leaders of Israel didn't really care about the people. And this was the perfect time for Jesus to point this out. You see, verse 21 here in John 10 indicates that Jesus was on his way to the Feast of Dedication. Also known as Hanukkah. It was a special time for the Jews to remember the failed leadership of the people in the temple. During the Maccabean era. And during Hanukkah, during that ceremony, Exodus 34 would be read out loud. Where it says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against 
the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? And the rest of the chapter continues on with this scathing criticism of Israel's leaders. And it was on the brink of this event that Jesus says the religious leaders are once again guilty of not taking care of the flock. But Jesus also wants us to know that he does take care of all his sheep. You may remember me saying earlier that there were two main types of sheep pens back in Bible days. One was the common sheep pen we talked about. It was found in the city where many shepherds would put all their sheep in there together. But there was another kind of sheep pen that was very common. It was a much smaller sheep pen found out in the country, usually made of brick walls. And it was small and it would have a, a narrow opening in the front for the sheep to go in and out. But there was no gate on these sheep pens. Do you know why? Because the shepherd was the gate for the sheep. When, when the day was done, when the sheep came in to the sheep pen, the shepherd would lay down in front of the gate so that no sheep could get out except through him. No predator could get in except through him. So in verses 7 through 9, Jesus is referring to this smaller sheep pen when he says, Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. They could come in and rest. They could go out and find pasture and run and play and be safe because of the gate, the good shepherd that was watching over them. And Jesus says, I have come to be your shepherd. The teachers of the law are not interested in protecting you. But I'll protect you. They're not interested in providing for you. But I will provide for you. In fact, in verse 10, he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Going back to the story of the blind man. We can see that Jesus provided for him, didn't he? He restored his sight. And you'd think the Pharisees would be happy that the man could see again. But instead, they just got angry. Rather than celebrate, they decided to interrogate. They demanded to know if this man was really the same guy that had been blind. And they demanded to know who it was that healed him. They didn't care about the man. They only cared about protecting their power. Their reputation. But Jesus was different. Instead of bringing accusations or questions... Jesus brought this man a solution. He restored his sight. He showed this man and everyone else around that he's a good shepherd who cares for his sheep. And Jesus cares about you this morning also. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have done. No matter what struggles or problems may be overwhelming you in your life right now, Jesus cares. He cares. He cares when you lose your savings. When you get laid off. When your health fails you. When your friends betray you. When your children rebel against you. When your church disappoints you. When your enemies attack you. When Satan tempts you, he cares. When we choose to follow the good shepherd, he cares for us. And the truth is, we need his care. We need it. Jesus compares us to sheep for a reason. Sheep are notorious for being dumb and defenseless. They literally do not have the sense to come in out of the rain. Sometimes they'll lay down and, and they'll get rolled over on their back and they panic. And all they do is kick their feet up in the air. They can't figure out how to get rolled back over and up on their feet again. There's actually a term for this. It's called being cast down. And when a sheep gets cast down like that, they'll just stay there. Until finally someone comes and rolls it back over and gets it back on his feet. And sheep are also defenseless. They, they can't run fast because their knees don't bend. 
They don't have big teeth or sharp claws or a stinger or even a, a, a mean sounding growl to scare away predators. They're dumb. They're defenseless. And out of the whole animal kingdom, this is what Jesus chooses to compare us to. Dumb, defenseless sheep. You know, sometimes we think we've got it all figured out though, don't we? We can solve our own problems, we think. We can take care of ourselves. We can protect ourselves and so forth. But in reality, we are helpless without our shepherd. Sometimes we might get emotionally or spiritually cast down. And we need the good shepherd to come and get us back on our feet again. Help us back up. Now some people are at least smart enough to figure out that they're not that smart. But others never do figure out their need for the shepherd. You know about the only thing a sheep can use to defend themselves is their hard head. And sadly some people are just so hard headed when it comes to trusting the good shepherd. Someone might even say, well, I trusted Jesus to protect me one time, but, but something bad still happened to me. Why didn't he protect me then? Why, why isn't he protecting those people in Ukraine right now? And those are difficult questions. But they don't change the truth. That even though God sometimes does allow us to experience painful and sometimes even fatal circumstances in this life, he will protect our souls. He will carry us through the valley of the shadow of death to a better life on the other side. So even at times when it's hard for us to see, Jesus is the good shepherd who cares for you. And you are the helpless sheep who desperately needs him. Let's briefly look at one more truth about Jesus we can see from this image of the good shepherd. And that is... He saves me. He saves me. We already saw in verse 9 where Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. And if you read on in that chapter, you'll see that Jesus talks four different times about laying down his life for his sheep. Verses 11, 15, 17, and 18. See, when Jesus left the glory of heaven, he came knowing that he was going to have to lay down his life for you and for me. He wasn't a martyr whose life was taken from him. He willingly gave up his life. He laid it down on our behalf. C.S. Lewis once said, it costs God nothing as far as we know to create nice things. But to convert our rebellious wills, it cost him crucifixion. Jesus paid a price for our sins that the religious leaders of that day could have never paid, and they wouldn't if they could have. They were like the hired hand Jesus spoke of in verses 12 and 13, who would abandon the sheep because they didn't really care about him in the first place. When Jesus healed the blind man, the teachers of the law were only concerned that it was making them look bad. They even went so far as to throw the man out of the synagogue, right? But when Jesus heard about it, he found the man. And he basically said to him, I am the Messiah. And John 9.38 says, The man said, I believe. And he worshipped him. So Jesus healed this man's spiritual blindness as well as his physical blindness. What a contrast. Think about it. Those imposters who were posing as Israel's shepherds kicked him out of the temple, said he wasn't worthy of God, and yet, the good shepherd comes along, loves him, draws near to him, and inspires him to worship God. It's interesting to note that some of the sheep were raised in the shadow of the temple for the purpose of becoming the sacrifice for their shepherd's sins. But Jesus came to be the good shepherd who would once and for all be the sacrifice for the sheep. Do you know what? That's an amazing thing. That the shepherd becomes a sacrifice for the sheep. Do you know that shepherd this morning? Are you listening to his voice? Are you following where he leads? Or have you been hard-headed? Maybe hard-hearted? He laid down his life.
for you. And he invites you to follow him into his fold where he will care for you and protect you and provide for you. He'll lift you up when you get cast down. He will give you life and he'll give it to the full. So, if you have wandered away from the good shepherd this morning, will you make this the time when you come back into his fold? Start listening to his voice again. Start following him again. Trusting where he leads you. Jesus is the good shepherd who leads your life. Will you follow? And if you've never made Jesus the good shepherd of your life, will you make a decision this morning to start listening to his voice? To give yourself in faith and trust to him. To make him your good shepherd. To allow him to be the one that guides your life from this day forward. If you have a decision to make, I'm going to ask the congregation to stand at this time. And if you have a decision to make for the Lord this morning, or if you have something you just would like prayer for, you can head over to the Next Steps prayer room right now. Someone will meet you there, and they'll take care of you there. So if you've got a decision to make or something you'd like someone to pray with you about, head over that way right now as I lead the rest of us in prayer. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus into this world. Not only to be the sacrificial lamb who died for our sins, but also to be our good shepherd who knows all about us, yet loves us deeply just the same. Who wisely leads us in, in the best direction for our life. Lord, I pray that you'll help us listen to his voice. Follow wherever he may lead us, that, that we might enjoy his protection, his provision, all of the blessings that come when we walk with him. And Father, as we do that, may it bring honor and glory to your name. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our good shepherd. Amen. You may be seated as we prepare for a time of communion. Uh, good morning. As we come to our time of communion, if you did not get one of our all-in-one communion things, please raise your hand and we can have somebody grab you one. We got one over here, guys. Thank you. Um, as you come to time of our communion, it's kind of centered around time. We were talking at the shop one day and just talking about how just time gets away from you, doesn't it? It goes quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker, especially the older you get. <laughs> you know, when you're a kid, you know, time didn't go quick enough to get out of school. But as you get older, time gets away from you. Sometimes time gets away from you because from my day starts at 6 in the morning, from 6 in the morning until whatever, you're going nonstop. Well, now, I do not agree with this statement, but we had somebody come in when we were talking, and they were talking about how they enjoyed the COVID shutdown because that gave them an excuse to do nothing. They didn't have to go to dinner, they didn't have to go to the movies, it, it slowed them down. Well, maybe that was one good thing that COVID came, but so when I, what I struggle with when I'm so busy is I don't have a lot of time to talk to God. I, I forget about talking to God. I usually talk to God all day during my day. You know, I'll thank Him for something. I had just amount of enough paper to do this, or I had just amount of do, and I know it's God, so I thank Him. But when I'm so focused on my day, sometimes that just that's not the first thing that pops into my head. So I struggle with that. So as we come to our time of communion, that's what I'm going to challenge you with from here on through the week. No matter how busy you are, give God your time. If you guys, if you out there have a time that you set aside, a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour a day, that you do nothing but crawl into a closet and talk to God, I applaud you for that. That is wonderful. Keep it up. For you that struggle like me, try and make it a, a, a mission to spend X amount of time just talking to God. Because He loves you. He is the great I Am. He wants to hear from you. So talk to him. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you so much for everything you do for us. We thank you so much for the sunny days. We thank you so much for the rainy days. We just ask, Lord, that as our days get so hectic, we just ask that you help us to slow down, take some time, and know what's the most important thing in our lives, and that is worshiping you, developing a relationship with you. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you guys for being here this morning. I think Steve gave us a great message to be focused on our Good Shepherd as we go throughout our, our week. For those of you that joined us on the live stream, thank you for, for being with us this morning. Uh, we just have a couple of announcements. The first is that Come and Be Fed this Wednesday is uh, canceled. There's no Come and Be Fed, so I don't know if cancel is the right word. But there's no Come and Be Fed for this Wednesday due to the spring break. So uh, if you show up, you might be locked out and uh, no one will be here to let you in. So. So no come and be fed this Wednesday. And secondly, uh, right after we get the chairs put up, uh, the, we'll be having a CIY parent meeting uh, in the youth room. Uh, for those who have kids going to CIY and just want some more information about uh, what that's all about and, and costs and travel and things like that, we'll have a meeting in the youth room, so plan for that after we get the chairs put away. So uh, why don't we stand and I'll close us out with a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for bringing us here together to worship uh, your Son uh, in your presence. Uh, Lord, you made a way for us through the, through the death of Christ. Uh, Lord, he truly is the good shepherd that laid down his life for us. I pray that we can be encouraged and, and uh, listen to his leading and his guiding only uh, as we go throughout this week and the remainder of our lives. In Christ's name, amen. All right, thank you guys.